We talked about the axial skeleton last week. That was chapter 9. And the axial skeleton was the skull, thoracic cage, and the vertebral column. Okay? Today we're talking about the appendicular skeleton. So think axial, it's an axis. The central line, appendicular, appendages, they hang off of the axial skeleton. So today we're going to talk about the pectoral girdle. So that's the uh, collarbone, the clavicle, and then your shoulder blade, the scapula. We're going to talk about the upper extremity, which is not synonymous with the arm. The humerus is the arm in anatomical terms. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about lower extremities, so the leg and the thighs and the foot, and then the pelvic girdle. Okay. So that's what we're going over today. So as we go through, what I'd like to do is have you all um, open up your bone boxes. And so I've got this set of bones. So if you all want to either just pay close attention up here or work with another group, either way. So we're going to go through and find all of these features on these bones so that you're familiar with it. Then I'm going to turn you loose and you're going to do it again in your groups. Okay? Repetition. We have to do things 10,000 times before it really sets in. Okay? Get my little pointer thing. Okay, so starting with pectoral girdle, we have the clavicle and the scapula. So the clavicle is this bone, so let's get this out of our box. Go ahead and get your scapula out as well. Scapula looks like this. Right here. Might be a little better if you scoot up a little closer. And then that's the scapula, you guys got the clavicle. Remember we talked about the sternum, the central bone, it's white right here. This clavicle is your collarbone. So it has two ends to it. It has a flattened, kind of smushed end that gets articulated with the manubrium of the sternum right here. And then it goes back, it dips back to articulate with our scapula. We have our scapula here. It's going to articulate like this. So imagine this is my collarbone. The smashed end articulates with this larger portion of the scapula here called the acromion. So we call this the acromial end of the clavicle. This is the sternal end because it articulates with the sternum. Okay? So it's S shaped. It goes back to your back. Think about it if it went outwards. You have your shoulder width way out here. Okay? So, on our scapula, we have a lot of things to notice. So, this more posterior feature that projects forward is called the acromion. Okay? That articulates with this acromial end of the clavicle. You also have this process. We call this the coracoid. It's got a C. We're going to see coronoid, coronoid. This is coracoid process. All right? They form the glenoid cavity, which is where the humerus is going to fit in. Right? So this is the scapula, and this inside portion of the scapula 
the depression, we call that the subscapular fossa. Makes sense, right? Below the scapula is the fossa, it's the depression. On the back side, the posterior side, if you take the acromion and follow it, you have a long, thin ridge. That's the spine. So think like the spine on your back. This is the spine of the scapula. Above it, you have the supraspinous fossa. Below it, infra spinal. Above, below the spine. Cool? Yeah? And regarding the borders, you also need the side piece. So a lot of these bones today, you'll need to know the side. So like the clavicle and the scapula. So if you just think about it, your arm hangs off the side of your body, so it can't face this way, right? Your glenoid cavity faces laterally. That would make this the lateral border, and this the medial border. It goes right in here, okay? So the back would be like that. Again, just keep in mind, coracoid, all right? Whatever you need to do to remember that. Okay, that was pectoral girdle. Questions about that at all? Cool. Let's get out our humerus. We're going to talk about the upper extremity, the upper limb. That one? Everybody got it? Humerus, this is the arm, okay? We have an upper extremity that contains an arm, a forearm, and a hand. So, if I ask you, name a feature of the arm, I want to know a feature of the humerus, okay? So, again, intuitively, the arm sticks in this way. We don't have arms hanging out, like, over here. So, the head of the humerus, this rounded region, fits within the glenoid cavity, and it's going to face medially. The glenoid cavity faces laterally. Make sense? Yes? So we have the head. Right below the head, you've got a ridge right here. This is the anatomical neck. So it's below the head. We also have tubercles. Tubercles are for attachment. So on the top, you got a big one, big projection, greater tubercle, or anterior, you have a smaller projection, that is the lesser tubercle. So greater, lesser, you're going to have two things, right? We're not just going to have a greater and not have a lesser. So bigger, smaller, tubercles. The way that, so we're going to hear tubercles, trochanters, and tuberosities. We call those the three T's of attachment. The way that I've heard people remember that the humerus has tubercles and not trochanters, they say that tubes have boobs because the humerus is located near the breast region, so tubercles located further up here, whereas we're going to see trochanters in the lower extremity. Okay, so again, whatever you need to do to remember that. Below our tubercles, we have the surgical neck. We call it the surgical neck because it's more likely to break there. You're going to have to have surgery to fix your humerus down here more likely than you will way up here at the anatomical neck. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then if you run your hand on the more posterior side, you feel a bump on the body about halfway through right here. Do I feel that? This is deltoid tuberosity. Deltoid, deltoid muscle will attach it, right? Three T's of attachment. Let's get our. There we go. Okay, now going down. So again, is this more proximal or distal? The head. More proximal. So moving further distally, we're going to go to where our elbow joint is. So you're going to see two condyles, two projections right here. One looks like a little bow tie. That's going to be the more medial feature, and then more laterally, you'll see sort of a rounded projection. So the bow tie looking guy right here, 
called the trochlea. The rounded one is called the, just lost it. Where is it? Um, trochlea. Capitulum. Capitulum is right here. Trochlea. Sorry, just lost it. Above those, we have a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle. These are condyles of special names, capitulum, trochlea. Above them, we have more condyles. Epi means above. Okay? So, trochlea, medial epicondyle, capitulum, lateral epicondyle. Okay. We also have two depressions that you need to know. On the anterior side, we have, you can see right here, coronoid. Fossa. Fossa, it's a depression. So it's right here. On the back side, you have a larger depression. That is olecranon fossa. So what do you think is going to fit into the coronoid fossa? Take a guess. Wild guess. Anybody? Say it out loud. Yeah, what fits into the coronoid Fossa. Okay, so if it's a fossa, we'll have some sort of a projection going into it. We're going to have a coronoid process going into the coronoid fossa. Similarly, we're going to have an olecranon process that will go into the olecranon fossa. Projection fits into a depression. Cool? And that is our humerus. Further up close, again, you can see that it's kind of a bow tie shape. Keep in mind that's more medial, and then your capitulum is more lateral. All right, so now our radius and our ulna make up which portion of our upper extremity? The forearm. Arm, forearm. Two bones. So let's start with our ulna. Ulna has four letters in it. You rearrange those, and you can turn it into luna. Notice this top portion here, the trochlear notch, is shaped like a half moon. That's how you can tell the ulna from the radius. Half moon, ulna, luna. Okay? So that half moon is called the trochlear notch. What's that going to articulate with? The trochlea. And it fits in really nicely. So everybody just trying that and feel it articulate at the elbow joint. So then we have two processes that make up this half moon shape. This is coronoid process. The one that's more superior is olecranon process. And just like we said, the olecranon process fits into the olecranon fossa. Coronoid process fits into the coronoid fossa. Very good. Distally, you see a small projection right here. We call that styloid process of ulna. Where else have we seen a styloid process? In the skull. Anybody remember which bone? Temporal bone. That's right. What's another feature that's next to the styloid process of the temporal bone? What is it? Mastoid process. Awesome. Okay, so we have our trochlear notch, we have the olecranon process, coronoid process, and then, see, is that all we got there? And our styloid process. So now, the radius. This flattened end that has a rounded depression in it, that's the head of the radius. That will articulate with the capitulum. Makes sense because the capitulum is a rounded dome shape, so this will fit right on top of that to articulate at the elbow. Okay? You have connective tissue keeping the forearm bones together, and at the bottom, you have a styloid process of the radius. Right down here, this projection sticking out of the bottom. Again, that's the distal feature, the head is the proximal feature. That's it. Oh, yeah. And then right here, you can just see the connective tissue keeping the forearm bones 
Pokeballs. Wrist bones are called carpals. We have eight of them. You're not responsible for any of them. Just know that wrist bones are called carpals. Okay? Hands. Our hands are made up of metacarpals. Uh, did I see a hand model in there? All right, well, let me keep this here. All right, so in our hands, so these are your carpals in your wrist. Then, starting with our, starting with our thumb, we're going to start naming one, moving to our pinky number five. So anatomical position, this is metacarpal one. Will be in here, metacarpal two, three, four, five. Okay? Phalanges are your fingers. We have three bones in our fingers, right? One, two, three. Proximal, middle, or what do we call it? Medial. I think it was medial. Middle. So proximal, middle, distal, phalanx. Phalanx is the singular of phalanges. Same numbering system. So what is this bone right here? Distal phalanx number five. That's right. So then, if I were to do, if I were to ask you which bone does someone typically wear a ring on when they're married, which bone would that fit on? Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, one, two, three, four. Right here. Proximal phalanx number four. Cool. Just keep in mind we start with our thumb. We're going to do the same numbering system with our feet. We're going to start with our big toe. All right, pelvic girdle. Pelvic girdle and pelvis, not the same thing. Okay? Pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones. The hip bone is called an os coxa. O S C O X A. Os coxa. In early adulthood, about 16 to 18 years old, three bones fuse to form one oscoxa. So you have the ilium, ischium, and pubis form this one bone. So again, you're going to have to side these. So easiest way to do that is to find this region right here called the pubic symphysis. And that will land right in the middle of your pelvic region. Yeah? So here's a complete pelvis. Make sense? One bone. Cool. Okay, so things you need to know. The ilium is this larger superior region. The ischium is this lower, more posterior region. And the pubis is the most anterior region right here. Okay, within the ilium, we have a depression. We call that the iliac fossa, the same way that we had the subscapular fossa, right? So it's just right inside there. We have an iliac crest. That's this top portion that you feel if you put your hands on your waist, okay? And then if you can feel something up here in the front region, this is the anterior superior iliac spine. So it's in the front, it's up top, it's on the ilium, and it's a thin projection. So iliac crest is what you feel on the top of your hips, anterior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine is what you feel in the front right here. Okay, also, this is called the ischial spine. Above it, we have the sciatic notch. So we have a greater and a lesser sciatic notch. The greater is bigger, the lesser is smaller. Everybody see that? Yeah. Cool. These are important because you're going to have to know male-female pelvis. So we're going to talk about these and then talk about the differences between them in just a sec. Ischial spine. 
right here, below the lesser sciatic knot, feel a rough patch. That is the ischial tuberosity. Um, another way that I've heard people remember the ischium being the more posterior feature, so that would be like more towards like this region, right? Um, is that someone said that you have a squishy issue referring to a bump that you feel here. So, again, silly, but it works. Um, and then pubis, pubic region, we're familiar with that. Okay, and then I mentioned where they connect in the middle, the two pubis bones, or the two pubis regions of the occipoxa, this is the pubic symphysis, symphysis, where they come together, this is connective tissue, arteries. And then below that, we refer to this as the subcubic angle, right? So pubis, below it, what's the angle there? Notice, in these two pelvises, the subcubic angle is quite different. Everybody able to see that? So if this one is larger, this one is smaller, yeah? This cavity here, it's called the acetabulum. That's where the head of the femur is going to articulate. Just like that. So it's similar to the glenoid cavity of the shoulder. This is the obturator foramen. It's the largest hole in the body. All right. Pelvis. A pelvis versus a pelvic girdle. Pelvic girdle to oscoxa. Pelvis contains those same two bones the sacrum and the coccyx, okay? So that separates our appendicular and our axial skeleton. The pelvis puts them all together. It contains a part of the vertebral column. Okay, so male, female pelvises. I put a little chart on that handout that I gave you all on the bottom. I just wanna go through that little table real quick. Because you will have to sex a pelvis. Uh, Dr. Mansfield Jones always makes you do it one way or another, okay? So, overall, which one is male, which one's female? What do you think? Male, female, right. So, just overall, you can look at them and you can see that the female pelvis is bigger, right? more robust compared to the male pelvis. Any idea why that might be? Babies, right. So we have some things up here. True and false pelvis. The true pelvis is from the ilium to the ilium. So just right in here, that region. So we call it like that is the true pelvis going across right on the inside here. The false pelvis goes from iliac crest to iliac crest. You see here. So it's larger. The true pelvis is smaller. This is the pelvic inlet. This is the female. Notice it is more oval shaped. The pelvic inlet in males is typically more heart shaped or apple shaped. Okay? It's not as round. Babies would have a harder time getting to a male pelvis. All right, so that is our, okay, so we also have a pelvic outlet. So pelvic inlet is this region here. Pelvic outlet would be the more um, inferior region. Take a look at the curvature of the sacrum in the male versus the female. Notice that the male sacrum is curved a whole lot more than the females. Do I see that? Again, got to have babies coming out of you. Don't want your sacrum and your coccyx to get in the way. Our subcubic angle is going to be greater than 90 degrees. It'll be about 90 or greater in a female. So one trick you can do, take a piece of paper, take your exam, your quiz, right? 
put it inside there, it'll be greater than your paper, which has a right angle on it. If I do that to the male pelvis, notice it doesn't fit in there as well. It's less than 90 degrees. So the subcubic angle is more pronounced in the upper. Let's see, did I go through everything on here? Oh yeah, greater sciatic notch. Also, much more pronounced in women. So take a look here. I can carry this thing with my thumb real deep in that sciatic notch, but in a male's, it is smaller. So pretty much everything is just larger, more pronounced in a female pelvis compared to a male pelvis. So, it's a little video you can watch if you want. You don't need to do that right here. Lower limb, we're supposed to be in done. So lower extremity, we're gonna start with our femur. The biggest one in the body, okay? This is our thigh. So our humerus was the arm, and our radius and ulna made up the forearm. We're flipping it. Now our big bone is the thigh, and our tibia and our fibula make up the leg, okay? If I ask about the leg, I'm referring to those two bones. If I ask about the arm, I'm referring to a single bone. Head fits into what? Into the acetabulum. All right, below the head we have a neck. We have trochanters. You have a bigger one and a smaller one, so greater and lesser. Remember, trochanters are on the femur. Tuberosities are on humerus. Tubes, boobs, pectoral region, right? Okay, um, if you look on the more Posterior side, you'll see a gluteal tuberosity. Again, it's a rough patch, bumps, rear gluteal muscles will attach. That continues to form a straight line called the linea aspera. So gluteal tuberosity, keep following it, turns into linea aspera. Okay? Okay? You'll feel a rough bump and then it turns into like a ridge. So if we go to the bottom, it's got two big projections, condyles, medial, lateral, named appropriately, right? And above them we have epicondyles. Knee bone is the patella. We call it a sesamoid bone because it actually forms within a tendon, okay? We're not born with this bone, so we start walking around and it forms within this tendon from where it is. I think that's kind of cool. So you can see here the anterior view, the posterior view. You can't see it directly head on, but you can from behind it. Yep. There are four ligaments in the knee. You only need to know two of them, and they're really easy. You need to know the ACL and the PCL. Anterior cruciate, uh, cruciate ligament, posterior. Cruciate ligament. So where are we going to find them? So one's going to be in the front, one's going to be in the back. Yeah. So if you look at the knee from the front, that's your ACL right here. My dog actually had to have ACL surgery about a year ago. We have PCL in the back. It's posteriorly located. The other two would be the, the uh, medial and the lateral. But you don't need to know those. Well, I guess those would be collateral, sorry. All right, last little bit. Tibia is the larger bone of the leg. I did it correctly. So it articulates like this. We have condyles that articulate with condyles. So lateral and medially, and then tuberosity, the rough patch right here, anteriorly located. And then if you run all the way down, you have a projection that sticks out at your ankle region down here, okay? Probably bumped it on like a door or something before. And that is your medial malleolus. on 
on the fibula, we have a lateral nowadays. Over on my femur up here. So the way these will articulate with one another will be like this. So medial lateral malleolus. A posterior view of how they articulate. Cool. Kevin Ware did that nasty thing. We're not going to watch the video, it's pretty gross. Uh, tarsals, ankle bones, you need to know two. Talus is going to articulate with the bones of the leg, right here, and the calcaneus makes up the heel. Those are the only two you need to know. Metatarsals, same naming process, metatarsal one, two, three, four, five, starting with the big toe, moving out to the smaller toes. And the phalanges, same thing. So we don't name them. Like if I asked for a finger bone or a toe bone, you would still call it distal phalanx four, whether it was in a hand or a foot. Okay, we don't have special names for hand or foot or a couple. 